Greetings, this is Greg. The de Havilland Mosquito may have been the most important British aircraft of World War II. It was conceived as a fast bomber, but successful in multiple roles, and it was made of wood. It's an interesting airplane from both a technical and a historical perspective. It's said that the U.S. Army Air Force considered having them built under license in the U.S. I want to start off by taking a look at that. Here's the story as told in Martin Bowman's book about the Mosquito. We'll try and verify all this later in the video. He talks about a demonstration of the plane in England during April of 1941, so this is before United States entry into the war. Present at the demonstration was Hap Arnold, who was the commanding general of the U.S. Army Air Force. Arnold took detailed plans for the Mosquito back to the U.S. and wrote a report about what he saw. The report and plans were evaluated by Curtis Wright, Fairchild, Hughes, Beechcraft, and Fleetwings. I need to take a quick detour here because I suspect most of my viewers have never heard of Fleetwings, although probably those other companies. Fleetwings was an aircraft company owned by Kaiser. Kaiser was a huge U.S. corporation. They produced steel and other metals. They had various divisions. They built aircraft, cars, dams, plus a lot more. And they were tied into lumber through Henry J. Kaiser's father-in-law. The Kaiser corporations were such juggernauts that it makes sense that they were included in this discussion, even though they were not particularly well known for their aircraft. As a point of interest, guess what part of Kaiser is the sole surviving company today? Out of all of that, only one company survives. It's the insurance division. I find that interesting. Back to the story from Bowman's book. The report on the Mosquito from Beechcraft, which apparently was in agreement with the others, said, quote, It appears as though this airplane has sacrificed serviceability, structural strength, ease of construction, and flying characteristics in an attempt to use construction material which is not suitable for the manufacture of efficient airplanes." Unquote. The U.S. decided not to build the Mosquito under license and continued forward with the P-38 Lightning instead. So is all this true? If so, was the U.S. decision the right one? I tried to verify this entire story, and although I couldn't find original sources for every detail, I think I found enough to demonstrate that it's true. In Hap Arnold's World War II diaries, he has an entry on the exact date Bowman mentions in the book. It's April 20th, 1941. And Arnold was indeed at an event in England where he examined various British airplanes, including the Mosquito. He literally wrote only one single word about the Mosquito, quote, outstanding, unquote. Nothing else, no context, nothing. And that's the only time in this 585-page document that he mentions the Mosquito at all. I don't have the impression that Arnold was much of an airplane guy. I think he was first and foremost a skilled administrator. For context, in this entire document, he never mentions the P-47 Thunderbolt and only mentions the P-51 Mustang once. So the fact that he mentioned the Mosquito and uh, described it as outstanding, I think is significant. So we can verify Arnold saw the Mosquito before the U.S. entered the war, and he thought it was great. We know that the U.S. received a Mosquito for evaluation, because we have some of those evaluations, and we know that the U.S. operated mosquitoes. We also know that the U.S. never produced mosquitoes, but bought a lot of P-38s and used them in many of the same roles. So I think the story in Bowman's book checks out. I think U.S. production of the mosquito was considered, but rejected, as it was thought that the P-38 was a better plane for the same job. So was Beechcraft correct in their assessment? We're going to go through it line by line. Later on, we're going to do that. Right now, we need to move forward and gather some more information. In 1920, Junkers came out with the JL-6, an all-metal airplane which caused a lot of excitement, so much so that the U.S. Post Office bought six of these, and the U.S. Navy reportedly ordered some, although I don't think they were ever delivered. NACA took notice of this, and their annual report for 1920 
had this to say about metal construction, quote, metal does not splinter, is more homogeneous, and the properties of metal are much better known and can be relied upon. Metal can also be produced in large quantities, and it is felt that in the future, all large airplanes must necessarily be constructed of metal, unquote. This was the point at which the aviation industry started to make the transition over to metal, but it would take time. One of the advantages of metal construction that was often mentioned was that metal doesn't burn, at least not as easily. Ironically, in the case of the Junkers JL-6, it had a defect in the fuel system that caused fires. This fire would then melt the aluminum between the engine and the pilot, causing flames to enter the cockpit. Two postal planes were lost this way, and the post office sold the remaining four at a huge loss. During the 1920s, the U.S. aviation industry worked aggressively towards building all-metal airplanes, but it wasn't easy. Metal looked better on paper, but translating that into an actual airplane proved more challenging than originally thought. Ten years after NACA had declared metal to be clearly superior, only 5% of aircraft in production were of all-metal construction. The problem, at least the main problem, and my source of this is NASA, was that metal thin enough to be sufficiently light would buckle when compressed. This necessitated the use of complex internal structures with complex curvatures, a lot of riveting and reinforcing. It took the U.S. aviation industry about 10 years to get all this figured out. There was also a severe corrosion problem with aluminum, but Alcoa, working with the U.S. Navy, solved that. I'm not a metallurgist, but if you want to know more about it, look up Allclad, which is spelled A-L-C-L-A-D. The U.S. had its first all-metal combat airplane in 1932 with the Boeing P-26, and the Navy had their first all-metal airplane in 1937. So it's clear that it took quite a while to get all the issues with metal construction worked out. Meanwhile, over in Britain, they were working on metal airplanes during roughly the same period. For example, the Gloucester Gladiator was introduced in January or February, depending on your source, of 1937, and was constructed primarily of wood. The Hawker Hurricane, which was partially constructed from wood, was introduced into service later that same year. About one year later than that, so 1938, the all-metal Spitfire was introduced. You have to consider the Mosquito within this context. The idea of building a plane out of wood wasn't all that crazy in 1938, 39, 1940. In fact, at that point, it had been the normal way of doing things just a few years earlier. The Mosquito was made primarily of wood. Of course, certain high-stress components were still made of metal. For example, motor mounts, landing gear, that sort of stuff. Um, also, internal hardware, uh, cables, pulleys and so on, and obviously the engines. So why build the airframe out of wood? The reason most often given is that wood was not considered a strategic material and aluminum was. That's certainly true, the strategic material part. I was not able to find much information on British production of aluminum during the war, but what I did find indicates that they were heavily reliant on imports of aluminum from the US. One source, this book, stated that in 1939, the British Air Ministry predicted that imported aluminum would be needed to supply two-thirds of Britain's wartime needs, and that that estimate proved to be low. Wood may not have been classified as a strategic material, it wasn't, but getting the wood wasn't trivial. In fact, it was almost as much trouble as aluminum, minus whatever bureaucratic issue may have accompanied the label of being a strategic material. The plane was made out of several types of wood. Among these were plywood, spruce, walnut in small amounts, and balsa. Much of this wood came from Wisconsin. The critical veneers also came from the U.S. The balsa came from Ecuador, mostly. So, while these may have been non-strategic materials, getting them over to England wasn't trivial, which is part of the reason mosquitoes were also built in Canada and in Australia. In fact, I think that was the main reason. The threat of a British factory being bombed by the Germans wasn't insignificant. It could have happened. But it wasn't high enough to move Spitfire production to Canada. They built mosquitoes in Canada probably because it was easier to source the wood there. Much of it came from the Pacific Northwest. 
The Australians sourced at least some of the wood for their mosquitoes locally, but I couldn't find much information on the Australian-built mosquitoes. Uh, the Canadian ones, they tended to source the wood from the Pacific Northwest, and the British ones tended to be from the United States. I think a bigger advantage of wood construction had to do with the labor supply. People who could work with metal were in relatively short supply, and those people were already being used in the war effort. On the other hand, people who built furniture and cabinets were largely out of work. Thus, there was a surplus of skilled woodworkers. This was also true in the Soviet Union, and they didn't have any problems getting aluminum, but they built nearly their entire air force out of wood. I think the main reason the Mosquito was built out of wood was because that's what Jeffrey de Havilland felt comfortable with, and he had to personally fund this project until it was at a very late stage of development. Here is the de Havilland family tree up to this point. Nearly every airplane they built was built from wood, and that includes all the planes which were really successful. Here we have the Albatross, which was an all-wood, 22-passenger airliner capable of a 210-mile-per-hour cruise speed, and it could go faster for short distances. It used the same wing cross-section as the later Mosquito, which was not a NACA cross-section. It's a 100% British design. It's worth pointing out that the Mosquito was one of the few frontline World War II aircraft not using a NACA wing. The P-47 is another prominent example. The Albatross's fuselage construction was very similar to the later Mosquito, so it's an important airplane in the lineage here. Only seven were built. One was destroyed on the ground in a German air raid. Two crashed. The second of those crashes was apparently due to the deterioration of the plywood wing. At that point, the remaining airplanes were scrapped. The airplane circled in blue is the de Havilland 95. It's an all-metal airplane, but it had problems. What we're most interested in here is the de Havilland 88 Comet race plane circled in green. This plane is the direct ancestor to the Mosquito. It uses the same basic construction methods, the same wing profile, and it's built to go fast. The Comet used stressed skin construction, which simply means that the skin of the wing, which was plywood, was structural. Metal wings are not normally built this way because if you used metal thick enough to do the job, it would be too heavy. Thus, metal wings get their strength from the internal structure, which has to be fairly complex, as discussed earlier. The stress skin of the Comet is quite different and requires far less internal structure. The Comet was fast for two main reasons. It was aerodynamically very clean. The British-designed wing was very efficient, and the wooden construction allowed for a very smooth finish. NACA described the fuselage as being almost perfect in terms of streamlining. The engine was special as well. It was the Gypsy 6 engine, which was a de Havilland engine. It's important to note that de Havilland was very familiar with engines, as they often built their own. Normally, the Gypsy 6 had about 200 horsepower, but for the Comet, they bumped the power up to 223 via a compression increase and some headwork. The compression was bumped up from 5.25 to 1 to 6.5 to 1. That was quite a big increase. The Comet was very fast and a successful racer, so when it was time to develop the Mosquito, Jeffrey de Havilland decided to go with what he knew would work, since he was spending a lot of his own money. He probably didn't want to spend even more tooling up to build a metal airplane, not only because of the expense, but he saw a lot of additional risk venturing into the unknown. Wood was simply the safe bet, and I think history has shown it was the right decision at the time. This is evidenced not only by the huge success of the Mosquito, but the problems de Havilland had when they switched over to metal construction after the war. Just like everybody else, when they switched to metal, there were problems. Jeffrey de Havilland's son, Jeffrey Jr., who was the first test pilot to fly the Mosquito in November of 1940, died in 1946 when the all-metal DH-108 suffered an in-flight structural failure. Then the de Havilland Comet suffered a series of structural failures from which the company never really recovered. They did fix the Comet, but it was too late. De Havilland was bought out by Hawker in 1960, and the final de Havilland design, the de Havilland 121, became the Hawker Sidley Trident, which was a decent airplane, but too late for the British to get a solid foothold in the jetliner market. <laughs>
Let's talk about the Mosquito. It was conceived as a fast bomber. It's what the Germans called a Schnell bomber, which literally means fast bomber. The Germans really wanted a Schnell bomber of their own. In fact, they badly needed one. But they never really got one in any significant numbers. Um, certain, they did have some fast bombers, the Arado 234, for example, but again, too little too late. The Mosquito bomber was fast. It was powered by two Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, and of course, the Canadian-built Mosquitoes used the Packard-built Merlin engines. As with other Merlin-powered airplanes, the Mosquito engines were upgraded as new developments came along. Jeffrey de Havilland looked at the Merlin while the Mosquito was in development and recognized that not only was it a good engine, but more importantly, it still had a lot of room for development. That turned out to be correct. Of course, the Merlin went through a series of improvements during the war. Most importantly, the addition of two-stage supercharging and intercooling, which, as with the Spitfire, added a lot of high-altitude performance. You can recognize the two-stage mosquitoes by the air inlet for the intercoolers, which are located just under the propeller spinners. The two-stage supercharger took the Mosquito from being a bomber that was very difficult to intercept and shoot down at low altitudes to a bomber that was almost impossible to shoot down at high altitudes. The Germans never really had a fighter that could realistically intercept a two-stage Mosquito up high, at least not in any numbers. Uh, some of the nitrous oxide injected airplanes could do it, uh, the, some of the Messerschmitts that is, the Dora 13 could, but few of those were built. I don't think any ever encountered a Mosquito. The 262 jet fighter shot down three that can be confirmed. We'll get into the speeds later, so there's, there's just a lot to cover there. The Mosquito had incredibly good, had an incredibly good operational record as a bomber, night fighter, and as a reconnaissance airplane. Which brings us back to the statement from Beach Aircraft. Were they right? Were there serviceability issues? No. In fact, if anything, damage to the airframe was easier to repair than on all metal airplanes. What about structural strength? Well, I suppose it depends on what you mean by that. In terms of battle damage, I would have to say yes. I'm just basing that on the fact that bullets go through wood very easily, and when it does, it causes splinters and cracks, which lead to breakage as soon as stress is applied. I realize some of my viewers are not too familiar with firearms. Let me try and put this into perspective for you. This is a telephone pole, they're now called utility poles, and the man is on there for scale. A German 8mm, British 303, or an American 30 6 so all the 30 caliber stuff, will go right through that pole at its thickest point and down at the base where it's wider. Three or four shots and that pole will fall over, maybe not right away, but as soon as it gets windy. There's a YouTube video titled, I Thought Wood Was More Bulletproof Than This, in which the gunman shoots through about two or three feet of wood with a 308, which is slightly less powerful than the guns we're talking about here. Wood is about the worst thing you could choose for resistance to gunfire. Of course, the Mosquito's primary defense is to avoid gunfire in the first place via speed. So, you know, whether or not that's a, a big factor, the resistance to gunfire is, is certainly debatable. Now, what about structural strength in the sense of the airframe holding together at speed or during maneuvers. That may be what Beechcraft was referring to, I don't know. In that sense, the Mosquito is just fine. There were some structural in-flight failures that took place in the tropics. There's room for debate on the reason for that. Initially, it was thought to be a problem with the glue. Hereward, hope I'm saying that right, Hereward de Havilland, uh, Jeffrey de Havilland's brother, determined it was due to water getting into the balsa, which caused swelling and shrinking in cycles leading to failure. The British Ministry of Aviation Production determined that there were defects in the construction of various mosquitoes built in British factories, as they showed the same problems and had not been exposed to monsoon-type weather. I don't know who was right, but de Havilland added a strip of wood to keep water away from the balsa, and the problem went away. I can't say if it went away because of that change or another we don't know about. In any case, we're talking about very few airplanes out of over 7,700 built and used in wartime. So whatever the problem was, it was fixed. So in that regard, I think structurally the plane was just fine. So I think Beach was wrong on, on that point as well. Ease of construction. Not much to be said here. De Havilland was experienced in building wood airplanes, so for them it was easier than metal.
I couldn't find the man hours required to build the plane, but the fact that they built over 7,700 of them and were able to set up factories and build them in Canada and Australia seems to indicate that it wasn't that hard to build by standards of the day for a twin-engine warplane. I'm not saying it wasn't complicated, I'm not trivializing it in any way, but it was certainly not more difficult than other twin-engine airplanes from what I can tell. What about the flying characteristics? Most pilot reports speak pretty highly of the Mosquito. There was some complaining about difficulty in handling the plane on one engine at low speeds, but that's actually the case with literally any high-powered twin-engine airplane. There is an airspeed below which you will not have enough rudder authority to counteract the engine at full power. I don't want to get into all the details on that at the moment, just know it's an issue with all the higher power twin engine airplanes that don't have center line thrust like a push me pull you Cessna for example. And the way twin engine pilots deal with this problem is they just never fly the airplane below that speed. You don't uh, lift off below it and you don't go below it until you're back on the ground. It's not really that big of a deal. We can take a quick look at a NACA report on the Mosquito. They tested an F8 model. That was a Canadian built plane it was a reconnaissance version used by the U.S. Army Air Force. The report only deals with stability, control, and stalling characteristics, but the Mosquito did well here. NACA didn't rave about its controls as they did with the Spitfire. Most of the descriptions of the plane, the plane's positive characteristics, used words like adequate, acceptable, and the like. They had a few minor complaints, but as compared with other NACA reports, it seems the Mosquito's flying qualities were at least as good as other twin-engine planes, and certainly not a problem. I don't think I've seen any NACA reports where they didn't have at least some complaints. Clearly, the report from Beechcraft was dead wrong. The use of wood did not sacrifice serviceability, flight characteristics, probably not strength, uh, and it didn't sacrifice ease of construction. Today, buried deep on the NASA website in the Cultural Resources section, you can find the following statement about the Mosquito. Quote, The lesson of the development of all-metal airplanes is that just because engineers may think a new material is superior, that does not mean that it will be immediately useful. It may take many years before designers and material specialists are able to adapt a new material to a new task. Unquote. That's NASA telling you that wood worked out just fine and in hindsight was the right material for the Mosquito. So, while we can shoot down Beechcraft's initial evaluation, there is still the bigger picture to consider. Was the U.S. incorrect in not building Mosquitoes and relying on the P-38 instead? That's a pretty good question. After all, the P-38s had variants capable of operating as a fighter, a bomber, a bomb leader slash pathfinder, photo reconnaissance, torpedo bomber, high-speed medical transport, and more. Some versions could perform dual missions like fighter bomber or the reconnaissance slash medical transport plane shown here. They even considered a seaplane variant. They had, to, they had to bend the booms up, which looks kind of weird. They did that to avoid saltwater corrosion. Uh, that's what you're looking at here. Essentially, for everything the Mosquito could do, there was a P-38 that could also do it. The obvious question is, how do these two planes compare in these various roles? That's going to have to be another video, as there's a lot to cover on that subject. So that's all for now, and have a great day. I want to take a moment to thank my Patreons. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, Patreon support is a huge help to this channel. YouTube revenue, their ad revenue, is extremely unpredictable and unreliable. Anyhow, uh, we're in Germany, and the path you see there is probably a thousand years old. It goes through some beautiful forests, meadows, and so forth. A lot of really nice hiking in uh, this region of Germany. We're fairly near the town of Morbach. Now we're up uh, on the castle grounds, and we're overlooking the moat there. This castle, uh, it's well, it's really castle ruins, the ruins of Baldenau Castle. But the castle was built in the very early 1300s. They don't know exactly when. They know when it wasn't there, and then they know when it was there. And by narrowing that down, they put it into the early 1300s, 1315, something like that. Uh, the castle was uh, was besieged several times, sometimes won, sometimes lost. And then uh, one of the invading groups did a lot of damage to it.
This is the grate over the well here, and uh, I did some high-level research, meaning I asked my wife, she knows a lot about castles, she says that that well is connected to the moat, which is not the best way to do it, but sometimes it was the only way to do it. And this is apparently where they probably stored perishables, uh, vegetables, and so forth. Uh, there was a lot of wood. There was a second and third story in this area. Um, my wife determined that by the holes in the walls and where platforms are for archers and various other things. And then this is the entrance to the castle keep. Um, it's locked up. Sometimes it's not locked up, but it's more often than not locked up. And the castle apparently has been suffering vandalism in the last few years. Something like 400 stones have been taken from it. Uh, in some time. Anyway, there's the moat again, and uh, that's it. Have a good day.